I'll keep this uh, very brief. Uh, um, this is a remarkable opportunity we now have uh, to listen to Eric Rosengren, uh, the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston since 2007. <clears throat> um, three adjectives come to mind. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's absolutely right on the mark. Thoughtful, deep, articulate. I've known Eric uh, for a number of years. Whenever he says anything, I listen very carefully. And I think that's probably why the room is packed. Um, Eric is also, this year, uh, a voting member of the FOMC. And that's been uh, quite salient in the newspapers, over, especially over the last uh, recent um, weeks. Um, as you all know, uh, President Rug Rosengren has uh, dissented on some recent FOMC votes. And he describes that uh, his reasoning on his website. It's very straightforward. Uh, so you can go to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and read about that. I'm sure it'll come up uh, uh, this morning. Uh, so um, let me just uh, pass the, uh, the podium to Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Daryl. It's a great honor to be introduced by you. I love the work that Daryl does, and his answer to the repo questions were exactly how I would have answered them, and it doesn't surprise me that we're pretty much aligned on, on that, uh, about what's going on with the repo market right now. We actually had an in interesting introduction when Daryl was speaking, and that was when the fire alarms went off. <laughs> so the lights were going on and off, the alarm was going off, and how did everybody in the audience react? They started to look around to see if anybody else was running to the exit. <laughs> and of course, nobody ran to the exit, so Kim was nice enough to go up and see if the place was burning down. <laughs> now, as a group of risk managers, I'm not sure when the lights are going on and off and the buzzer's going on and off, that seeing who's going through the back door is the most sensible reaction. <laughs> Particularly because this auditorium is much like a movie theater. There's an exit sign there, an exit sign there, and the only person standing by that door was me. <laughs> and everybody else was going to the back. So it's a perfect example of why you worry about financial risk, is because if everybody was gonna run to the back and if we had smelled smoke, that wouldn't have been a good outcome because there are only two doors there and this seats 450 people. That's a bad outcome. Now with four doors and half the auditorium going to the front and half going to the back, we would have had a much more successful outcome. So one of the reasons that I'm worried about some of the actions that we've taken recently is that I don't think we're taking enough consideration of how some of the things that we're doing has risks to it. And that's really a theme of what I'm gonna talk about for monetary policy in this discussion. So sorry to benefit from your uh, disadvantage there, Daryl. So let me start by just saying, as uh, Daryl just highlighted, that we just had an FOMC meeting and the decision of seven of the 10 people that were voting this time was that we should reduce the federal funds rate by 25 basis points so that we're now at one and three quarters to 2% range. <clears throat> And I dissented. There were two other dissents. One dissent was they wanted to drop it much more, and that was by Jim Bullard. He wanted to drop it by 50 basis points. And Esther George, the president of the Kansas City Fed, like me, dissented, saying that we didn't think it was necessary to reduce rates this time. So listed here is kind of the reasoning behind why I thought that wasn't necessary. And I'm gonna go through this with a group of slides, basically using figures and no equations or numbers either. And uh, the basic argument is pretty straightforward. First of all, monetary policy is already pretty accommodative. So we're talking about a federal funds rate that's below our inflation target of 2% now. That's pretty unusual. That is normally a circumstance when we're really concerned about the economy. The second is there was a talk of R star in the panel right before. I think Charlie was the person who uh, brought up R star. And we are asked as part of the summary that we provide around FOMC meetings quarterly, uh, 
what we think the federal funds rate will be in the long run. And it, <clears throat> that number has come down over time. It's currently 2.5%. So in the long run, we think the nominal Fed funds rate is going to be 2.5%. So obviously, 1 and 3 quarters to 2% is substantially lower than that. So arguably, we're already quite accommodative. The next thing that I would highlight is where we are in terms of the economy. So the Fed doesn't focus on the yield curve. Our objectives are not tied to the yield curve. They're not tied to financial markets. They're tied to where unemployment is relative to full employment and where inflation is relative to our inflation target. Our unemployment rate right now is at 3.7%. That's close to where we've been as a 50-year low. So labor markets are tight. You see it in New York. You see it in Boston. Uh, plenty of places around the country are experiencing very tight labor markets. The second aspect of that is inflation. Core PCE has been trending a little bit below 2%. I'm expecting it to go up. But uh, the CPI has actually been going up, and I'll show you a slide in just a minute that shows you what the monthly trend has recently been. And if you looked at the trim mean, we're right at 2%. So by many estimates, we're pretty close to our 2% inflation target. So the economic data suggests we're about where we want to be. And the economic forecasters think that's going to change dramatically. Well, actually not. If you look at where the private sector actually has the economy going, they're expecting the unemployment rate at the end of this year to be roughly where it is now. And they're expecting inflation to be around 2%. So while there are certainly lots of risks right now, and many of them were raised in the, the panel before, I, and we do have to be mindful of those risks. Reacting too much to risks and not to outcomes, I think, has consequences. And I'm going to highlight a couple of those consequences. One is going to be very similar to the ones that Daryl highlighted, which was leverage lending. I'm going to have a leverage lending slide that's a little bit different than his point, but very similar. The second is a little less conventional. It's going to be talking about the potential for a run on commercial real estate. Uh, and I'll give an example of why I think that there are structural changes going on in the commercial real estate market that make that much more runnable than it has been historically and why we should be concerned about that risk. So that gives you roughly an outline of where I'm going. So let me start with the charts. So this first table, uh, everything on the top is actual data. Everything on the bottom is a forecast. It's pretty straightforward. It's basically just showing you what the data sequence has been uh, since May of this year. The unemployment rate through the summer has been right at 3.7%. Hasn't changed very much. If you look at the core CPI, it's gradually going up, not down. So uh, the CPI tends to run about three-tenths higher than the PCE, which is actually the uh, inflation index that the Fed focuses on. But at 2.4, it's roughly consistent with where I'm expecting the PCE to go over time, which is 2 to 2.1%. You can see also in terms of what's been happening in the stock market that we're roughly where we were back in May. So a lot's happened over the course of uh, the summer. Certainly tariffs went on. Uh, there was a lot of question about whether they'd go on or not. September 1st, they did go on. There are another couple rounds that may or may not go on. But despite all the, the twos and fro's from the stock market, we're basically where we were before, which is relatively close to all-time highs. So where does the consensus forecast? This is taken from the blue chip. So one reason I'm using the CPI is because the blue chip forecasters use CPI rather than PCE. But you can see where they're expecting the economy to go. From June to September, you can see that they took two-tenths off. But 2.3% in an economy at 3.7% unemployment is not a bad outcome. My own estimate of potential would be roughly one and three quarters. So if you're getting a 2.3%, that's also consistent with the unemployment rate actually falling. And in fact, that's consistent with their forecasts. They're expecting at the end of the year, we're going to be a tenth off. It's not a big difference, but 3.6 is lower than 3.7. It's still very tight labor markets. And you can see for the CPI change, They've taken one eighth off, or one tenth off, but that's basically what is happening at the time that they were doing the forecast to oil prices and food prices, because the CPI, ideally this would be a core CPI, but that's not what they actually asked the blue chip forecasters to forecast. 
But overall, this is an indication that the economy is in reasonably good shape, and the modal forecast, at least, is that that's going to continue. So in that environment, we've been reducing our interest rate. So this is just the federal funds rate. The solid line uh, that's brown or black is what the actual Fed funds rate is. The dashed line is just taken from the futures market, so it's not my forecast. Uh, it's certainly not my forecast, but it is the market's forecast of what we should be doing. So they're anticipating at the December meeting, uh, we just took a, was the probability uh, out of plurality of that number. So uh, the plurality for December at the time that we were doing this chart was that we'd have another 25 basis uh, point decrease by the end of the year. And you can see the 2% inflation target. So with this most recent reduction in the federal funds rate, we are now going to be at a situation where we're below where we expect inflation to go over time, which is to say negative yields for the federal funds rate. If you think inflation is going to be 2%, you're getting less than 2%, you're actually willing to get a negative real rate in order to hold federal funds. So to me, that indicates a pretty accommodative policy at a time when we're actually at full employment. Another measure is what I mentioned before. So the summary of economic projections, the SCP, we're asked what we think the federal funds rate will be in the long run. It's basically equivalent to a nominal R star is what we're asking there. In the long run, what do you think the rate of the federal funds rate would be that would keep inflation and unemployment rate constant at the level that they should be? And you can see that we've had 2.5% both at the June meeting and the most recent meeting. And you can see, again, that the actual was already a little bit less than where we thought the long-run federal funds rate would be uh, as of June. And we've redu reduced rates twice since then. So we're now pretty substantially below where we think the long-run federal funds rate will be. And if you believe the financial markets, chance that will go even further down. So by all accounts, this is a very accommodative monetary policy. So the current conditions, labor markets are tight. Inflation is close to target. Forecasters think that their modal forecast is that will continue. And yet monetary policies become quite accommodative by either looking at it compared to where we think inflation is going to be relative to our target or compared to where uh, we think that the federal funds rate will be over the longer run. So one of the things we should think about is where are we relative to R-star. I was thrilled that in the panel we talked a little bit about R-star, so I won't have to go into as much detail about what R-star is. That top panel is showing you where the unemployment rate is relative to the CBO's estimate of the natural rate of unemployment. And so you can see right now to the far right, the unemployment rate's below the estimate of where we think a long-run unemployment rate would be. And in fact, if you look at the summary of economic projections, it's four and a quarter. We're currently at 3.7, so we're roughly a half a percent below uh, where we think full employment is. We're at very tight labor markets. On the bottom, one of the ways of thinking about how to measure monetary policy is what is the Fed funds rate relative to the federal funds rate you think that is necessary to keep inflation and unemployment rate constant? And that's what R star is. And you can see it's from the law of Buck and Williams. You can see the definition uh, in the footnote. And you can see that right now, it does, this ends at the second quarter, so it doesn't include the last two cuts that we've had, that we're going to be going back down to negative. Now, if you compare the top to the bottom, you also see the recession shading. So periods when the unemployment rate gets quite high, you see R minus R star is negative. We have accommodative monetary policy when you have a high unemployment rate. Similarly, when the unemployment rate's quite low, is also the periods where R minus R star is positive. That makes sense. When the unemployment rate is very low, that's a time when monetary policy normally is tight. What's going to be different is to the far right, we're going to be in a period where the unemployment rate's quite low but R minus R star is actually going to be negative. That's not the usual way that we think about monetary policy. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does mean we have to ask ourselves, does it make sense to be doing something that we haven't done historically 
over the last 40 or 50 years. Similarly, this is the exact same chart, but with inflation. So we have the inflation target that's 2%. It's a little bit unfair because we didn't really have an inflation target of 2% back to 1988, but we just put it, put it back to 1988. The, the actual true 2% target didn't start uh, till after the financial crisis, but there was basically an implicit inflation target of around 2% that basically started in the mid-90s. And you can see that the markets figured out that out even though we didn't actually uh, state it explicitly at the time. And then I have the trim mean PCE and the core PCE. You can see it fluctuates around, <clears throat> the, the trim means right at 2%, core PCEs a little bit south of where we want it to be. The R minus R star is exactly the same. Now let's look at the correlation. In periods where inflation's high, so it's above our target, tend to be periods where monetary policy tends to be restrictive, so R minus R star is positive. And when R minus R star is negative, it also tends to be periods where inflation uh, particularly around recessions, uh, causes the inflation rate to be below our inflation target. So here it's a positive rather than a negative correlation, but the same thing holds. If you think we're right at our inflation target, this is an odd time to have R minus R star going back down. So just relative to history and what we've done over the last 40 or 50 years, monetary policy is behaving a little bit differently than it has historically. <clears throat> now another indicator that you might want to look at is people are concerned about the risks that are occurring. Obviously tariffs are one, geopolitical concerns are another. One of the places that you might look, and it was mentioned in the previous panel, that housing market is doing a little bit better. Uh, normally building permits is one of the indicators that people look at if you're concerned that we're about to go into recession. You can see the recession shading, and you can see particularly in the late 80s, and prior to the financial crisis, building permits were dropping quite appreciably going into those recessions. Right now, you're not seeing an evidence of a significant drop off. In fact, um, they couldn't have planned better. The building permits actually spiked up rather than down uh, with the, uh, the, the last report. But building permits is certainly not showing signs immediately of a problem. And initial claims, this is initial claims for unemployment insurance. So people talk about investment but if firms are worried about an economic downturn, you would expect that they would start laying off some of their workers. And in fact, you can see that initial claims tends to rise prior to the recession shading. So if you're really worried about investment, you'd also be worried about bringing labor on at the same time. And so you'd be expecting that we'd start seeing initial claims, at least in some places, start to move up. But actually what we're seeing is it's pretty close to a low, and we haven't seen much of a deviation at all. This is quite consistent with what the economic forecasters are saying, which is their modal forecast isn't for a really bad outcome, it's actually for more of the same. So given the current economic conditions, monetary policy is already unusually accommodative. So what are the times when we expect accommodative monetary policy? Well, we expect monetary policy to be really accommodative in a recession when unemployment rate is high and inflation is low. Right now, inflation is around target and unemployment rate is low, not high. So at least historically, this has not been the way we've behaved. You might be worried if you were starting to see a bunch of indicators flashing red that we're about to go into a recession. So if initial claims were going up, building permits were going down, other kinds of indicators were highlighting a very significant problem. Yeah, I pay a lot of attention to that. People talked a little bit about the consumer being good. Um, you have to also think about what the weighting of these things are. So consumption is 70% of the economy. So if you think the consumer is gonna hold up, it's pretty hard to have a really bad economic outcome if the consumer is doing well. Just a thought exercise. If consumption grows at 3% and it's 70%, that's 2.1%, even if all the other components, business fixed investment and all the other components are zero. So if you get really strong consumer, you're not likely to have a bad outcome. Now the consumer can be fickle and the consumer can change, so you can't be overly dependent on that, but consumer confidence is still uh, relatively high. So another alternative would be, what's the cost of lowering interest rates? And part of that would be, 
inflation may be around 2%, but it's 2%, it's not 2.5%, it's not 3%. And unemployment rate is low, but what's wrong with just pushing unemployment rate a little bit lower? So if there were no cost to monetary policy at times when inflation are low, the right answer is that interest rates should be zero. Do we really think that interest rates should be zero at a time when you're close to where you are at full employment and inflation's close to 2%? I would certainly answer that negatively. And the reason I'd answer it negatively is I'm worried about the financial stability concerns that come with interest rates and that came up in Daryl's presentation as well as the panel presentation. So low interest rates, one of the ways they work is they encourage people to take more risk. That's one of the channels of monetary policy. It also encourages people and firms, households and firms, to take on more leverage. So there is a consequence to lowering interest rates. And so those costs are going to be, how significant do we worry about the financial stability risks of having monetary policy unusually low at a time when the economy is not performing particularly poorly? Now, I would say that lowering interest rates is not a problem in a recession, because that's when credit is being pulled back. So when it's being pulled back, people aren't going to the riskiest elements. In fact, quite the opposite. You're trying to encourage banks to lend. You're trying to encourage people to take out financing for a house or for a car. But it's very different if you're at the top of the cycle rather than the bottom of the cycle. Because at that stage, you're incenting very different behavior. You're asking firms to take on more risk at a time when credit's not being pulled back. So you're putting on more and more risk onto the balance sheets of households and firms. So I'll give two examples of what I'm worried about. This is an average debt multiple to EBITDA of uh, highly leveraged loans. So it's already loans that are risky. You can see the definition. It's LIBOR plus 225. And it's asking what are the multiples that you're actually seeing you can see that there was a run up going into the last recession. It came down quite substantially as the financial crisis occurred. Stayed flat for a couple of years. You can see that it's gone right back up. And in fact, it's now much higher than it was in 2006. So it's not just that corporate leverage in general is going up. It's that for some of these riskier loans, they're actually riskier than they have been historically. So people are taking more risk as interest rates are low. It's a natural incentive when interest rates are low that you do take more risk. That's exactly one of the ways monetary policy works. But I like Daryl's comments that uh, we do worry about the macroeconomic consequences of this. So if we do have a recession, not that I'm predicting it's going to happen nearly as soon as Dick Berner is expecting it, but if we do have a recession and you have this much leverage, how are these firms going to react to that recession. They're going to have to shrink their balance sheet. They're going to have to lay off employees, and probably in a very draconian way. So if I care about employment through the cycle, not at a point in the cycle, I should be worried about charts like this. Taking on this additional leverage is actually taking on macro risk that the next time we have a downturn, there are going to be much more significant outcomes for employment than we actually want. So if you care about employment through the cycle, you might worry about this financial concern. Now, I've been uh, a bit concerned about commercial real estate for a while. Ed Altman will say I was here four or five years ago and talked about it. And I had such a big impact that it's gotten even riskier since I talked last time I was here. Um, but this is looking at the cap rate. So think of it as the inverse of a PE ratio. And so as this number goes down, it's saying that uh, it's the opposite of the PE. You're, you're not getting compensated nearly as much uh, per unit of real estate. And you can see for apartments, it's per particularly low. But you can also see that it's lower for all the cat major categories of real estate. Now, why you would expect this. So when the treasury rate goes down and interest rates go, lot, go down, commercial real estate is an asset that when you're thinking about reach for yield, well, I'm one of those European banks or European insurance firms, and I'm looking at negative interest rates. This may not be a great cap rate, but yeah, I'll have to take exchange rate risk, but I'm at least getting a positive return by buying into the US. And in fact, if you look in New York and Boston at who owns a lot of the buildings, increasingly, it is foreign companies looking for 
a higher return than they can get in their domestic countries. So let me talk about a structural change that I actually, I think, gives me some concern. And that's the co-working business model. So let me talk a little bit about why I think that this is a risk. Not necessarily, I'm not talking about it as an investor. I'm talking about it as a financial stability concern. So just go through the very basics of the idea. You have an office property owner. They have debt and equity. They have a lease. That usually is a long-term lease, 10 to 15 years. But who they're leasing to is they're allowing subleasing to tenants that are short-term tenants. They could be so-called members. Think of it basically, though, as kind of a one-year rollover uh, for tenants. Now, those tenants, by and large, tend to be individuals, small businesses, the type of organizations that get hit the hardest if we were to have an economic recession. But there's an added feature that at least some of these co-working businesses are creating special purpose entities that makes them bankruptcy remote. What does that mean? It means that the parent company at the top in the middle is insulated from some of the properties going under because they have the option to walk away from the properties. Now, they don't necessarily have to. If it's an isolated example, they probably won't. But if it's a bad recession, and you're seeing the area around Soho going down in price, and you have a lot of property in Soho, you may decide that the reason I created these special purpose entities was to be able to walk away from them if it starts imperiling the holding company's capital. Now, sometimes there are other kinds of guarantees that are put in, but the basic model provides you the opportunity to, in effect, not be required to pay your lease off in the event that the only thing that they have is that special purpose entity that doesn't necessarily have any assets in it. So why would I be concerned about that? Well, it's a risky structure. So think of this as long-term leases with property owners, but I have short-term leases in my sublease agreement. This model has not been tested in a recession. But think of other entities that had the same feature that they have long-term, but then they allow short-term. You could think of banks. You could think of investment banks. You could think of a lot of financial intermediaries. The difference is a bank has deposit insurance. There's no deposit insurance in this model. So if people start running by not renewing their leases, it actually is a problem for the model. And to the extent that they use these SPEs, there's a greater likelihood that they walk away from the property when there's an economic downturn. That results in more vacancies. And eventually, if there are enough vacancies in that building, it means that banks are going to take losses. So to Daryl's definition of what financial stability is, a loan supply shock, there are a lot of firms that are banks that hold commercial real estate. So banks are not going to be insulated from this. Insurance companies aren't going to be insulated from this. And it's not just going to be the owner of the building that has a lease to the shared workspace. Presumably, it contaminates the buildings around it as well. So when your building next to you is empty, and they're trying to rent it at very cheap rents, if I'm next to that building, I'm not going to be particularly comfortable with the fact that whenever my leases roll over, I'm going to have to do it at a much lower rental agreement as well. So we've had this kind of structure in lots of financial stability concerns before. What's unusual is normally for commercial real estate, you have longer term leases, they're staggered, they don't all come at the same time, and they don't normally occur just when the recession occurs. But if you have short term leases that are not renewed in the recession, and the long term leases don't become economically available, then you basically have a potential run on commercial real estate. So that is a problem. Runs were a problem in 2008, and this arguably could be a problem going forward. Think about the reach for yield component. Why would a landlord 
lend to somebody who is a special purpose entity? The answer is clear. They pay a higher rent. You pay a higher rent, and you're trying to get a higher multiple, and you're that European insurance firm or European bank, and you're concerned about that. You say, well, I'm not wild about this. Maybe I get a one-year guarantee for when the build-out's occurring. But cap rates are really low, and if I want to make sure I get a higher return, this is a perfect reach-for-yield kind of activity. So in many respects, this is the kind of problem that we actually saw during the financial crisis. There were runnable liabilities, and those runnable liabilities were accompanied by a reach for yield. Now, it happened in the mortgage market with financial institutions, primarily the investment banking sector. But the same structure is what happens in almost every financial stability crisis. You have runnable liabilities, and you have this kind of structure where there's a reach for yield during the good times, people pull back in the bad times. Now, I'm using this as an example of what is the cost of interest rates being low. These kind of models become much more attractive in a very low interest rate environment. So I do think that there are costs to having interest rates low. It's not costless to having low interest rates. So it's not that we shouldn't lower interest rates when we really think the economy is doing poorly. We clearly should. But the question is, is the economy doing really poorly? So in my view, the economy is still reasonably healthy. There are clearly risks. So I can see the same risks that were mentioned in this panel in terms of trade, geopolitical risks. We certainly had another reminder uh, with the problem in Saudi Arabia. We've had reminders with what was happening in Hong Kong. So it's, um, I'm worried about Brexit as well. All these risks are, gonna, are not only here, but they're going to be with us probably for a while. None of these things are going to be solved immediately. But if our answer to this is just lower interest rates as long as we have these risks, that's potentially a problem if it's not costless. And so I do think that there is a cost to very low interest rates in terms of financial stability, because how people react is exactly what we're incenting them to do. You're incenting people to take more leverage. You're changing the cost of credit. You're going to get people to take out more credit as a result. And if households and firms take out more credit, it may not be a problem immediately, but in the next recession, it's going to be obvious that they overextended themselves, making the next recession worse than it otherwise would be. So we have a dual mandate. We care about inflation. We care about unemployment. But it should be through the cycle that we care about. So we want to think about whether our actions today are having a big impact on the future. And I would say right now that there is a risk that we're taking as we push interest rates as low as we have. And so that's why I dissented. So I'll we'll stop there. Be glad to have people line up uh, to answer some questions. And uh, if people could identify themselves as well when they ask the question, and uh, be glad to answer any questions that come up. Looks like uh, the right side won in terms of the race to the mic. So go ahead. Uh, Leon Chen, Avenue Capital. Yeah, why don't you um, move down so I can sure. see who you are. <laughs> so um, you pointed out some good points for dissenting. So can you explain what the other members who wanted to cut rates, what data points they're looking at to make them think the other side? Thank you. Yeah, so let me, I don't know if I can be as fair to the people that voted differently, but let me give you a chance. <laughs> um, there clearly are risks. So if you value those risks as being quite likely, even if the economic forecaster thinks the mode is that it's not going to be a big problem, the analogy is to taking out some insurance, that we think that there's a high enough probability that the trade issues become a broader issue. Dick actually raised this issue that we're worried about manufacturing, we're worried about trade, you definitely have sectors of the economy that are going to be severely impacted, and we actually are seeing that. So I didn't show any of the economic indicators tied to manufacturing because it's obviously been impacted by the trade uh, problems that we're facing right now. But that is one sector. So our goal is not to get investment right or to get manufacturing right. It's to get the economy overall right. 
And so I would put more weight on the fact that I don't think manufacturing necessarily is going to contaminate all the other areas. If I start seeing consumers getting much weaker, I'd have a different view. But as of now, they're not. It actually looks like consumption for the third quarter is going to be a very strong number, probably north of the 3%. So it's going to make up for a lot of the negatives in other areas. So it's not that I couldn't imagine a situation. In fact, if the consumer starts becoming very concerned, in part by people talking about recession, then I will become more concerned. Because if consumption's not strong and these other sectors are not strong, now I'm worried about a recession. But I actually want to see the evidence before we actually take the action. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Colin Teicholtz from Blue Mountain Capital. Uh, thank you, first of all, for such a cogent explanation for, uh, for your decision to dissent. Uh, the, the question I have relates to the, the recent editorial uh, that, that former New York Fed President Dudley uh, wrote and, you know, obviously talking about political uh, reasons for, for making decisions for, for you and, and your colleagues. And I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you know, certainly, you know, you, you, there was nothing political at all about your explanation or what I've expected it to be. <laughs> But, but why would a former official as, as prominent as, uh, as Bill Dudley have, have written those comments uh, if, if political considerations never enter into these uh, deliberations, as Chairman Powell has indicated? So I can't speak for other people, obviously. I can say that my, in my own experience around the, there was nothing here about politics. Um, and at the time, I've been at the FOMC, and I'm the longest serving member of the FOMC, so I've been there for a while. Um, the politics are not what we talk about. In fact, we talk about coefficients. We talk about R star. We talk about equations. If you're not an economist, it's a pretty boring two-day conversation. <laughs> so we're not talking about some of the things that you'll see on a news channel. And to, my experience has been that people are not politically motivated. In fact, that everybody around the table is doing this for public service, and they're doing it because they think it's the right thing for the economy. Now, we can disagree. I actually think that's a strength of the Federal Reserve, which is I can have a disagreement, and maybe six months from now, I'll be in the majority and have a strong disagreement with somebody descending in another direction. That part of the way the system is supposed to work is we're supposed to have differing opinions. The majority wins the vote. We have to come to a conclusion every six weeks. I think the system does work. I don't think it is particularly political. Hi, I'm Peter Nowicki. Um, the ECB recently lowered its deposit rate from negative 40 to negative 50 basis points. Yep. To what extent do you think negative interest rates are actually responsible for the lack of growth in Europe? Um, and haven't we learned a lesson from Japan? So this is purely my own personal view. Uh, I don't think negative interest rates are the way to go for monetary policy. And I certainly don't think pushing long-term yields very negative are a particularly productive way of getting the economy going, in part because one of the things you want to do is encouraging lending. And if your banks are having all kinds of financial issues, if you're having negative yields across the yield curve, it's very hard. One of the ways that financial intermediaries make a profit is by having a positively sloped yield curve. And if you're in an environment where that's not going to happen, not only now, but for the foreseeable future, that is a problem for actually the suppliers of credit. And that's not just banks. There are plenty of other intermediaries that have a model that really depends on the fact that individuals normally require a higher return to have a higher maturity hold up of their funds. So my own personal view is that I would not be enthusiastic about going to negative yields. and. Uh, I think that the Europeans should be looking for other ways. So worrying about spreads, I think, is really important. There are all kinds of political reasons why they haven't chosen to do that. Um, but I think working on spreads that are positive makes a lot of sense. Pushing sovereign yields to very negative values, in my own view, would not be uh, something that we should do in the United States. And it's not just the financial intermediaries. I also think that it undermines confidence and confidence is an important part of how we think about the economy works. So you do care a little bit about how your behaviors and communications are being transmitted to the public at large. I think the, if the highest return is negative, that is a, not a great signal to the broader public. Uh, Lawrence Loeb, 
first, I want to thank your colleagues because my wife and I are buying a co-op. <laughs> <laughs> but we would have bought the co-op either way, so the only way that lowering the rate has helped is sometime in the future when maybe we'll have a little bit more discretionary funds. My question really is, at this point in the cycle, does the Fed really have that much ability to influence what's going on? I mean, back in the financial crisis, you guys were heroes. You saved the system. But you haven't had any real help from fiscal policy for quite a while, given the problems with the, the politics. Uh, with trade problems, you can't do very much. Uh, if you're lowering rates, you're trying to encourage people to borrow. But if people have outstanding student loans, they're not really in a position to borrow. Households may not want to extend themselves any further. So you're, and as somebody who's been in the LBO world, we, we like that too. <laughs> but I'm not sure that that's really promoting the kind of economic activity that traditionally you're looking to create by lowering interest rates. I mean, w w what are your thoughts on this? So I do think that lower interest rates have over, they do stimulate the economy. Uh, exchange rate is something you didn't mention, but exchange rates are affected by interest rate differentials, as was mentioned in the previous panel. That's one of the mechanisms that works. Uh, you may not have been on the edge for buying your condo, but there are plenty of people who only qualify if the interest rate goes down a little bit. Those people are then able to afford a house. Cars are essentially getting to jobs. A lot of people don't have the money to buy a car with cash, so they have to take out a loan. As those loans go down, you can afford more car. Um, so there are a number of things that I do think are interest sensitive enough that it does stimulate the economy. It's just, so I'm not arguing that it doesn't provide some stimulus. I would argue that is it stimulus that we need at this point? And another argument that I would highlight is that interest rates are bound by zero if you're not willing to go negative. And so if we're at one and three quarters to 2%, yeah, we're now talking about seven more reductions when we hit zero. So I don't want to get to zero before we actually have a bad outcome that I want to address. So I do think that there are certain aspects of monetary policy that are not perfectly linear. And a perfect example is buying a house. So you just bought a condo. If I lower interest rates by 50 basis points, you're not going to buy a second condo. You might refinance. And that will relieve some of your constraint. And same thing with firms. They're going to refinance their their debt as well. So the, it's not that the interest rates don't help, but one of the ways monetary policy work, as well as in the risk channel, is that you move up purchases now thinking interest rates are unusually low. So I purchase a house, I purchase a car that I might have waited another year. So maybe my car is five years old, maybe I'll get a new car now rather than waiting till it's seven years old what, the way I had planned. So I do think interest rates have an impact that is meaningful. I just think that there's a cost to pushing it down too low. And I don't think inflation is going to be picking up quickly, but wages are going up, prices are going up. If we do have an economy that pushes the unemployment rate further down, we're having a strike right now at one of the large auto uh, companies. I think that's partly a reflection of tight labor markets. You don't go on strike if you're worried your job's going to disappear. You go on strike because you think that your wages haven't gone up as much and you think you can get another job if you are laid off. So. I think the conditions are for more inflationary pressures that will gradually build over time. I think that's actually a positive thing. Um, but I don't think we need added stimulus to get that outcome. Hi. My name is uh, Andrew Oslander. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, regarding the uh, commercial mortgages, a, a lot of commercial mortgages are obviously securitized into CMBS and insurance companies and asset managers obviously hold that CMBS. I wanted to get your opinion that not only if what you say could take place, uh, banks would get hit, but what about all the holders of CMBS? Well, I think to the, to the extent that shared office space is appearing in these securitizations, you need to think about what the risk is that is occurring. So anytime you're buying a commercial property, you should care who the tenants are and how the tenants are going to respond in the next recession. And if you have a model that changes the nature of the tenants or the nature of the tenants' agreement, you should be factoring that into the pricing, not only of the initial uh, deal, but also if it gets sold into the secondary market. So the same risks that apply 
in the primary market apply in the secondary market, that I'm not in this business, but I would be concerned if I was surrounded by buildings that had shared office space as their model, because I'd be worried that my space will be affected if they have a much softer market in the next recession than, than they're anticipating. So I think it is a risk for the securitized market. This is still a relatively new uh, market, but I actually, if you just type shared office space for Soho, right around NYU, all kinds of Google Dots come up. So it's not just one or two. This place is surrounded by shared workspace. It's not just one company, it's multiple companies. So if this becomes a prevalent model, you have to ask, how resilient is it to the next recession? It hasn't really been tested yet. Now, I might be completely wrong, but I think the next recession will tell whether I'm completely wrong or not. And I think it certainly is a risk that we should at least be thinking about. Ethan Heisler, KBRA. Can you comment on the persistence of effective Fed funds over the IOER rate? When this was originally introduced, the IOER was supposed to be the top of the top. And for the last, for almost the whole year, effective Fed funds has actually been above IOER. In addition to that, I guess you could also comment, uh, is it alarming to see the effective Fed funds rate this morning and yesterday post the Fed actually 25 basis points above the top of the band? So this actually gets back to the repo question that Daryl addressed. So uh, we're running a monetary policy that's based on having ample reserves. And that ample reserves ideally means that we're primarily affecting uh, the federal funds rate by IOER and thinking about rates that the Fed actually sets. But we've also had reserves come down and we haven't known exactly where it is that reserves start to be tight enough that interest rates end up moving up and we're starting to get a scarcity of reserves. So to the extent that we've seen the rates crawl up over the last six months, nine months, that's an indication that we're getting to a scarcer reserve setting. And I think what we've seen in the last three days is that there are a lot of corporations that were paying their taxes. We're probably gonna have some more events at the end of the quarter because end of the quarter events tend to uh, cause pressure on money markets. So there are a number of ways to address it. I don't view this as a long run problem. I don't view it as a problem for the economy overall. I do think that we have to think about what's the most desirable solution and how important it is to have reserves so, so tight that you have this risk. So one is you could create a facility so that it caps how high those interest rates go. So that was something that's been widely discussed. The other option is to continue that whenever there's a scarcity of reserves that we do these repo agreements in order to provide reserves at the time their stresses and maybe start increasing slowly the amount of reserves. The third option would be to buy a bunch of government securities, probably treasury bills, so that we really do have ample reserves and that they're ample to the point that we're not worried about uh, various factors affecting the money markets enough that we start seeing it in rates. So my own personal preference would be to move towards much more of a buffer than what we have and you do that by expanding the amount of securities that you're holding. So we could pick any one of those three. We haven't decided on which of those three we're gonna pick. Um, so as a committee, that's gonna be a committee decision about what's the best way to, to resolve this. I viewed this as a short run, not a long run problem. And I think um, the, the reserve scarcity is a solvable problem. And my guess is that over the course of time, it'll stop becoming an issue. So last question. We have Michael over here has a question. And perhaps you can ask your question at lunch to, to Eric. Yeah. Michael Livian, thank you very much for taking the last question from me. I wonder if the Fed that does have a contingency plan, if actually an outcome, economic outcome that is unexpected occurs, since interest rates are already pretty low and the balance sheet is uh, quite big. Do you ever think about this? I'm not expecting a, a full answer, but do you ever think about these things at the Fed, how you would uh, react to a, a bad economic uh, downturn? 
I think about it all the time. <laughs> um, so first of all, I would say we're in a better position than many other countries. Europe and Japan, as was mentioned before, have negative yields across the yield curve. Um, we do have some room on short-term rates. Now, we're losing some of that room with these insurance cuts, but we do have room to push the federal funds rate to zero. I would disagree a little bit with our balance sheets large. So like any corporation, we have assets and liabilities. So one of the reasons our balance sheet has gotten much larger than it was in 2008 is currency holdings have gone up. And so as currency holdings go up, we have to hold more assets to balance that off. And the fact that we're seeing some scarcity reserves right now tells us that our balance sheet actually isn't that large. In fact, we're getting to the point where if you were gonna implement a scarcity of reserves model, we're not that far from that point. So I think we have plenty of capacity to increase our balance sheet should that be necessary. And so that means that we would buy more long-term securities and presumably those would be treasury securities so you could push the, the longer part of the yield curve down. So that's another way that we could do it. We could also, this probably would be a little bit harder, but buy more mortgage-backed securities and push mortgage uh, rates down as well. So I think we have other tools. We do think about that. We also have forward guidance about talking about how long we'll keep interest rates low, which also has an effect on not just uh, the interest rates that the Federal Reserve is setting, but also other kinds of interest rates. So I think we do have tools, but my preference would be to have a little bit more room at the short end of the market so that whenever that next recession occurs, we can primarily address it with short-term rates. We're currently going through a framework discussion, and one of the main things we are thinking about is do we have enough policy space, and what can we do to provide a little bit more policy space? So that is part of the deliberations. We've uh, had kind of a public listening tour. We had a big conference in Chicago. Um, we're having meetings at FOMC meetings that are talking about uh, what our framework should be going forward. No decision's been made, and we're still uh, you know, only partway through the process. This isn't an issue we're not thinking about. I can guarantee we're thinking about it all the time. Any central banker has to think about these kind of issues because while you don't expect a recession, you know at some point we'll see one and you want to be prepared for that outcome. So thank you very much. Thank you.